morning and welcome to chapel. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Have you ever looked at someone who, to whom good things were happening and think, Oh look, God's blessing them. Or have you experienced something good in your life? Perhaps a promotion at work, a good harvest or the birth of a, a healthy child, and thought, God has surely blessed me. Well, today we read in Matthew's Gospel the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. The word Beatitudes means the blessed sayings. This makes sense, of course, because each phrase begins with the word blessed. But what does it mean to be blessed? What can the Beatitudes, these blessed sayings, tell us about the nature of God's blessing? To start with, let's ask, what does it mean to be blessed? The word we translate as blessed in our gospel text is makarios, which means to be favored or gifted by God. So when we think about good things happening to ourselves or others as evidence of God's blessing, we are thinking that God is giving us a gift. And so he may be. But if you are honest with yourself and you look deep down, you'll find that a part of you thinks that you've earned this blessing. When you got that promotion, you thank God for his blessing. But don't you pat yourself on the back for the job performance that merited the promotion? When you have a good harvest, you thank God for his blessing. But don't you think of the countless hours of toil to plant, care for, and bring in those crops? When you give birth to a healthy child, you thank God for his blessing. But don't you take pride in all you did to ensure that child would be born healthy? Am I saying that one, excuse me, what I'm saying, am I saying that these good things are not evidence of God's blessing? In no way. What I am saying is that one can diligently work for these good ends without good results happening. Just think of the person passed over for a promotion that goes to one who deserved it less, or the years where weather or disease prevented a good harvest, or the expectant mother who does everything right and miscarries. God's blessing is a gift, and it is distinct and unrelated to our efforts. So when we think 
of God's blessing and as somehow earned by our efforts, we aren't thinking of God's blessing. We're thinking of God's reward. In the same way, when we read the Beatitudes, we want to think of the blessings as resulting from our actions. We are, in, we are poor in spirit, or we hunger and thirst for righteousness, or we are peacemakers. So God gives us the good things he spells out in the text. The problem is that these good things, receiving the kingdom of heaven, seeing God and the others, are descriptions of salvation from our sins and eternal life. Scripture is clear on this point. In Ephesians, Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If Jesus is saying that these good things result from actions, the actions he specifies in the Beatitudes, then the good things, salvation and eternal life, are rewards, and we have uh, rewards we have earned. And then we are saved by our works, and these blessings, in effect, become laws. But Jesus doesn't say laws, he says blessings. And Paul says we are saved by grace, excuse me, we are uh, saved by grace through faith as a free gift of God. So we must look at these Beatitudes differently. The blessings Jesus speaks of here, our salvation and eternal life, are unrelated to our conduct. The actions he specifies are not prerequisites of God's blessing, but evidence of God's blessing. So now, let's take a look at these blessed sayings and see how this evidence of blessing, or the signs of God's freely gifted faith, at work in the Christian. The first of these Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is one of those sayings that sounds beautiful, but we don't quite understand it. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, first off, the text doesn't actually say poor in spirit. The word we translate as poor is tohas, which doesn't mean poor. It means a beggar. Tohas literally translates as one who lacks all means and is completely dependent upon another. Given that, we can see that to be poor in spirit is to be completely dependent upon God for all spiritual things and that we are incapable of doing anything to acquire the kingdom of heaven. It can only be given as a blessing from God. Next, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So Jesus is telling us that comfort comes to those who are suffering the loss of another. Is that what he's saying? Well, I trust that comfort does come. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. The mourning Jesus refers to is not a grieving over a loss. That is a completely different word. No, Jesus is referring specifically to a grief that results from one's own sinfulness or the sinfulness of others. This goes far beyond the pricking of one's conscience, but is an overwhelming anguish at the absolute wrongness of one's actions. Only the Christian can suffer such a soul-wrenching grief in the face of their own sinfulness. This morning is evidence of God's faith at work in, in you and can be taken as evidence that God can and does forgive your sins. Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. To be meek is to gently submit to God's will or the wrath of others. It is to accept suffering, just or unjust, without reprisal. 
Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Here again, our language fails us. For when we read hunger, the text actually means that we crave, kind of like a chocoholic obsessing to get just one bite of Hershey's special dark. And when we read thirst, the text actually means to painfully desire, like a man lost in the desert, suffering and dying of thirst, yearning for just one drop of water. And for what do we crave and painfully desire? For righteousness. Not a righteousness toward us, but within us. We crave and painfully desire to be acceptable before God. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Here we have a clear message. God's mercy in forgiving our sins leads to a desire to show this same mercy to others. Like we say in the Lord's Prayer, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Here, he's using the language of a metalsmith. He's not referring to a heart free of sin or impurity, but a heart being purified like iron is purified in the smith's forge. Have you ever seen how a smith purifies iron? In Jesus' day, they couldn't produce fires hot enough to melt, off, melt the iron and skim off the, the impurities like we can do today. So, to purify iron, the smith placed the iron in the fire until it was white hot and then beat it over and over forcing out the impurities and brushing them away. Then he quenches the iron or cools it in water and puts the iron back into the fire only to repeat the process again and again, but never achieving absolute purity. So, when Jesus speaks of the pure in heart, he is speaking of the heart enduring the burning and pounding away of our sinful nature over and over again. Jesus continues saying, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Here, the peace Jesus speaks of is reconciliation between quarreling brothers. So, in loving response to our reconciliation to God, our Heavenly Father, we desire, as Christians, to reconcile with our brothers and sisters who have wronged us or whom we have wronged. For this is what it means to be children of God. Our last two signs of God's blessing should be viewed together, for they are different aspects of the same sign. This sign is persecution. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And then he says, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. The Christian faces persecution. We are persecuted for our yearning to be acceptable before God. We are also persecuted because we are part of the body of Christ. We are at odds with this world, both as individual redeemed souls yearning to be right before the one who redeemed us, and as members of his body testifying to a world lost in sin. Our yearning to be acceptable before God is seen in the eyes of the world as judgment by those living in opposition to God's will, and rather than seeking God's mercy and forgiveness, they lash out. In the same way, the body of Christ testifies to a world lost in sin. And rather than be reconciled to God, our Father, this world 
falsely reviles and persecutes and speaks evil against Christ and us with him. Finally, Jesus declares that we can rejoice and be glad. He promises us that what is to come is worth what we face today. The persecution we face, our quest for reconciliation, our ongoing purification through suffering and hardship, our desire to treat those indebted to us mercifully, our craving and painful desire to be right before God, our submission to hardship, our grief over our own sinfulness, and our absolute dependence on God. These are signs of God's blessing, His free gift of saving grace in our life, excuse me, saving faith in our life. So, we can rejoice and be glad because this free gift, this blessing means that we will receive the kingdom of heaven and we will inherit the earth. Our mourning over sinfulness will be comforted and our yearning to be right before God will be satisfied. We will receive mercy we do not deserve. We shall see God and he will call us his children. This is indeed cause to rejoice and be glad. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.